In this light, we remember that we are not alone. That God is present in us and in all those we meet. Surely God is in this place. Help me notice. Help us notice together. O oh God of shepherd, warrior, and prophet, creator of first peoples, pioneer, and saddlebag preacher, light of immigrant, loyalist, and seeker, we live with history and we love your presence in it. We trace our roots to your creative powers. We embrace one another as children of your spirit. As we celebrate our history today, help us to remember all of it, that which makes us proud and that which makes us ashamed, that which reveals our closeness to your word and that which reveals our distance. Remind us of your constant presence, forgiving, restoring, recreating, and making all things new. Hear us, Redeemer God, as we dwell for a moment in your goodness. Amen. Welcome to this time of worship with Leaside United Church. As I begin, I acknowledge that I am on land that for thousands of years has been the meeting place of many indigenous peoples, the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Wendat. Where I am right now, in Toronto, is on the lands of the Toronto Purchase Treaty of 1787, and Treaty 13 of 1805 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. The Leaside area is also within the Williams Treaties of 1923. So, we are all treaty people living on treaty land. And we must commit ourselves to learn and to work towards justice and peace. This Sunday we mark Canada Day remembering that our country's histories have stories of courage and of cruelty, of community and of division, of wisdom, intolerance, and hope. Looking at the harm that has been caused does not mean we need to ignore the good that has been nurtured. Celebrating what is possible together does not mean ignoring what is wrong. 
What does it mean to be a part of this country? How do we recognize the divine light of God within the faces and the words of each person of Canada? Let us pray. Creating God, as we mark the anniversary of the Confederation of Canada, we remember and give thanks for the people who have been the stewards of this land since time immemorial and commit ourselves to the work of justice, healing, and reconciliation. Together, we dream about the country that we hope to become, a country where all are set free to be their best selves. Amen.
Today, our scripture reading comes from 2 Kings. It's a story that has a number of characters, and we're going to break it up during the service to allow us to listen to how this speaks about two themes, the idea of nations, the interactions between nations, an idea of pride in your nation, and a second theme, a theme of healing. So we begin the story like this. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now, the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. So our story doesn't start in Israel, the focus of so much of our Hebrew scriptures of the land of Aram, and Naaman, a great general. And we hear from the very start of this story the history of so many, perhaps all nations, based on violence and conquest, the fighting of powerful people and the way smaller people get caught in between. In this story, it's a young girl who is captured in a raid, a young Israel girl who ends up a slave, although this translation says servant, on her own away from home. It's easy to miss the role of this young girl in the story. Not the role, actually, but her life. The change that she has experienced. The loss that she has suffered. It can be easy just to focus on the words and the wisdom that she shares. The way her words offer that possibility of healing. But we can't just do one or the other. We can't ignore the harm that she has suffered or the violence that is at the heart of the interactions between nations to look only at the good that she speaks. And we can't do the other either. We can't only look at the violence in the story and miss the hope that is present through her words and her decision to speak about a possibility of healing for someone who suffers, even when that person has been the cause of her own suffering. So the story starts with Naaman, a powerful general who also has leprosy. And in this story, as it continues, we see that the disease of his body is also reflected in his larger need for healing. But on this path of healing that Naaman begins on, it starts by listening to the voice of someone who is overlooked by the wisdom of someone who has been harmed, by the grace that she is able to speak and offer in the midst of all that she has experienced. When we think about healing, we can think about healing in personal terms. 
and in terms of our communities, and in terms as well of our nation. This poem is by George Eliot Clark. It's called Blank Sonnet. The air smells of rhubarb, occasional roses, or first birth of blossoms, a fresh undulant hurt, so body snaps and curls like flower. I step through snow as thin as script, watch white stars spin dizzy as drunks and yearn to sleep beneath a patchwork quilt of rum. I want the slow, sure collapse of language washed out by alcohol. Lovely Shelley, I have no use for measured, cadenced verse if you won't read. Icarious like, I'll fall against this page of snow. Tumble blackly across vision to drown in the white sea that closes every poem. The white reverse that cancels the blackness of each image. Whose voices are we listening to? What stories, what poems, what wisdom are we hearing? Let us pray. Holy God, rock that sustains us, tree of life, waters of creation, we give thanks for the taste of raspberries, the scent of roses, the snap of fresh peas, we are filled with thanksgiving for lakes and cities, for wildlife and communities, for people and possibilities. Be with us once again in this opportunity to celebrate accomplishments, to mourn harmful choices, to remember to seek new directions. Be with us once again in this opportunity to turn our gaze to our nation, to turn our heart to our world, to be attentive to the suffering, to be attentive to the strength and wisdom, to be a part of the love that underlies all. We bring the prayers of our hearts, the stories of our souls, our worries for others, our grief and our joy, and we share it in this silence with you. inspire us as we move into the future so that our actions may actively contribute to creating a place where all creation is cared for and all people are respected and loved, where healing is possible. Amen. Our responsive psalm, Psalm 66.
Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing to honor of God's name. Make glorious the praise of God. How awesome are your deeds. So great is your strength, your foes wilt before you. For all the world shall worship you, shall sing to you and praise your name. Oh, come and see what God has done, a work that is awesome to all Earth's children. God turned the sea into dry land. They crossed the river on foot. There we rejoiced in God, who rules in power forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious lift up their heads. Bless our God, all peoples, and let the sound of praise be heard. God has preserved us among the living and kept our feet from stumbling. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You led us into the desert. You laid a burden upon our back. You let sickness furrow our brow. We passed through fire and water, but you brought us out to a land of plenty. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to, for, to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. A 
Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go, wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. So we move on to the politics part of the story. We take a moment to note how remarkable it was that not just Naaman, but the king of Aram listened to this young girl about the possibility of healing and then approach it with power and might, with lavish gifts, with horses and chariots, and we remember that these two nations are not currently at peace, that Israel has just recently been the subject of raids. The king of Aram pushes the bounds of their nation, sensing the weakness in a recent uh, change in kingship in Israel. So what's behind this letter that the king of Aram sends? Is it, as the king of Israel suspects, a pretext for war? An impossible demand that can't be met and gives an excuse for increased aggression? Is he acting out of genuine hope that a healing not possible for Naaman in his own country might be possible somewhere else? We don't know what's behind the king of Aram's request. We certainly sense that Naaman's desire for healing is real, and we know clearly what the king of Israel thinks about this. An excuse for war. And then along comes the prophet Elijah, Elisha, who hearing of this danger that Israel faces, as well as this need for healing that Naaman has, says to send them to him, the man who had been mentioned all along. Naaman arrives with horses and chariot, an important person, and an Elisha does not come to the door to meet him. Instead, he sends a messenger. A continuation of the power plays happening. L. Daniel Hawk says of Naaman's reaction to this. Naaman appears oblivious to the possibility that the Israelite prophet does not want to meet a man who has caused so much suffering or that Elijah's response gives him a dose of his own dehumanizing medicine. Now, the first step in healing, listening to the voices that aren't often heard, the voices that have experienced suffering. A second step of healing, traveling to a new place and then recognizing that all of the power and might that you carry does not offer a guarantee of good treatment, of a response. Does Naaman have to recognize a different truth. Rudyard Firon wrote this poem, A Different Way. Truth, in all its nakedness, came upon me in a sudden way. Forgive me, naked one, you have startled me. I was clothed and could see 
in quite a different way. So when we think about healing, in personal terms, in terms of our communities and of our nation. What is the truth that we're invited to hear? What is the clothing, the armor, the chariots that we bear with us that mean we don't listen clearly to what that truth is that must be set aside so that we can listen in a different way. Naaman, it must be said, doesn't respond well. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean?
But Naaman's servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he says to you was, wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Naaman's first reaction to Elisha's instructions and Elijah's decision to act the way he does is anger and national pride. Aren't our rivers better than your river? Isn't what I have better than what you have? Isn't what I know better than what you know? Once again, Naaman has to listen to a servant remind him that something is more important than this pride that he holds on to, that possibility of healing. If the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? Perhaps more often than we like to admit, the way that we reach healing is simple rather than difficult. And if we knew that there was a difficult task ahead of us with clearly laid out challenges like Hercules conquests, then we could attempt it knowing that we're doing something great. But what if healing is something a little simpler? What if it's more along the lines of listening and believing people when they talk to you about their experience? What if it's something simpler like giving people the space to grieve and be heard in their grief? What if it's something simple like saying it is unacceptable for anyone in our country not to have clean drinking water? What if it's something simple? What if it's something simple, not difficult? That's what's needed for healing. Simple like saying grace as expressed through healing Water, food, shelter, these basic necessities is not something that has to do with who you are, how good you are, or how much you have. But a basic necessity for all people, one that should be guaranteed, without judgment or condemnation or borders and boundaries. Naaman's healing becomes a healing of his body, but it also, through that, becomes a healing of what is inside. A hawk also points out that if we had read one verse further than lectionary suggests, we would hear that part of his healing. Naaman is indeed a new man when he exits the Jordan with the skin of a boy. He continues to relate deep and genuine gratitude 
both to Elisha and to the God who has done what no earthly power or deity have been able to. The healed Naaman is deferential rather than prideful. I now know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a gift from your slave. The changes in Naaman's speech reveal that his mind has been as diseased as his body. Now healthy again, the enemy general expresses gratitude and defers to the prophet. Suzanne Buffon wrote this poem, The New Experience. I was ready for a new experience. All the old ones had burned out. They lay in little ashy heaps along the roadside and blew in drifts across the fairgrounds and fields. From a distance, some appeared to be smoldering, but when I approached with my hat in my hands, they let out small puffs of smoke and expired. Through the windows of houses, I saw lives lit up with the otherworldly glow of TV, and these were smoking a little bit too. I flew to Rome, I flew to Greece, I sat on a rock in the shade of the Acropolis and conjured dusky columns in the clouds. I watched waves lap the crumbling coast. I heard wind strip the woods. I saw the last living snow leopard pacing in the dirt. Experience taught me that nothing worth doing is worth doing for the sake of experience alone. I bit into an apple that tasted sweetly of time. The sun came out. It was the old sun with only a few billion years left to shine. We might hear ourselves as Naaman in this story. As one of the kings, as the young girl who's been enslaved, as the servant, as Elisha or the messenger, the grace and healing and new possibility exist for them all. So here are a few more words from Hawk that we listen to on Canada Sunday as we reflect on what healing means. The story as a whole then precipitates a radical shift in the reader's perspective and humanizes the enemy. Yahweh's prophet who will advise Israel's kings in future battles with the Arameans. Here heals an enemy who suffers. As a consequence, we see Naaman no less than his Israelite victims as a human being worthy of caring and kindness. The Old Testament account does not ignore the horrendous suffering that Naaman has inflicted. Yet, it prompts readers to resist the hateful, caricatures and the leprous demonizing of enemies even when the demonizing is well deserved. The enemy who perpetuates violence and brutality is no less a human being than those who are its victims. Enemies can be healed. And even victims can fall prey to a diseased soul. Or, as a modern prophet proclaimed, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that.
let's join together in the prayer that Jesus taught so long ago, which had been shared in so many different languages and ways. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. So may you go this day and listen. May you go this day and take the journey needed toward healing. May you go this day and in your life and in your words to our nation, share the message of the simple things that are needed. And in all that you do and all that you are, Remember that God, the creator, source of love. Jesus Christ loves incarnation, and the Holy Spirit loves power and promise is with you, now and always. Amen. Wherever we go, God will already be there. Help me notice. Help us notice together. <laughs>